What is going on everybody and welcome to my supercomputing series. My goal here is to just get you all familiar with the ideas and concepts of supercomputers and then I will actually show you all how to build a supercomputer step by step for as little as $80 but probably more like $120 if you don't have all of these supplies. So that'll be fun. But first, we need to know uh, a little bit about what it is exactly supercomputers are, why people use them, and so on. So, supercomputers have been around for a while. They were first introduced in the 1960s, but they really had very little purpose to them. Initially, they just had a few processors kind of tied together, though by the 90s, there were you know supercomputer setups with thousands of processors. Nowadays, we've seen supercomputers with tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of processors that comprise them. So that gives you an idea regarding you know the growth and evolution over time. Uh, the main idea driving supercomputers is this notion of parallel computing. Parallel computing very simply just means calculations that are being solved simultaneously, and they're kind of it's almost like they're, you're solving. I guess more in depth, the idea is you're taking a large problem or question, and then you you divide it into a bunch of littler littler smaller parts uh, and questions or calculations and then each node or computer comprising this system is tasked with one of these smaller bits to the problem at a time. Each node is served with a different problem and fed new ones as they finish and they kind of work in a synchronized fashion. Parallel computing has actually come up in the past in my videos here uh, in the form of machine learning. It's based on the same principles where breaking down the problem and solving that problem simultaneously in its parts is usually more efficient than attempting to solve the, that same problem linearly. So some calculations can be done at the exact same time uh, where they don't really rely on the previous solution before they can like begin the calculation of the next part of the problem. So you've got linear computing and parallel computing. So linearly would just be step by step literally and parallel computing is where you've got multiple computations happening at the same time. So solving a problem using parallel computing is just also simply just more realistic and uh, when it comes to like complex modeling or even things like genetic programming where it literally the problem you're trying to solve is an interaction between multiple variables at once. And so when you have problems like that, it just not only is in reality, is it the case that you've got multiple var variables happening at the exact same time? Uh, so it, not only are we trying to like more accurately depict certain scenarios, but also it just makes, it's actually easier to calculate these kinds of problems with a supercomputer. So some of the larger fields that use supercomputers are things like medicine, quantum mechanics, weather research, oil and gas exploratory research, that kind of stuff. With medicine, one of the more popular applica applications to supercomputers is actually called folding. So today, folding can actually mean a few things, but the original term folding uh, in the sense of what's called folding at sign home comes from the simulation of protein folding so you can actually donate your computing time and power to folding at home which is where you're aiding basically in disease research and other forms of molecular dynamics research uh, so it's kind of neat that you can donate in this fashion rather than your dollars and so on this was really one of the first ways for people to donate in CPU time and uh, energy so now we actually have Bitcoin, which allows you to do this for literally anything you can imagine, since you could generate the Bitcoin and then simply don donate the Bitcoin. So that's pretty neat. So the purpose of supercomputers, again, solve a complex multivariable problem by breaking it down into tiny parts and assigning separate nodes to each part along the way. So what is one reason why this is superior? Well. Um, besides the fact that like literally it's easier and more efficient to model a problem like that by actually breaking it down and solving for each of the like you know parts uh, another reason why this is actually useful is like when giving a computer a problem to solve sometimes a solution to a problem will require waiting on a solution from another um, or the problem is um, so like let's consider a six core processor for example so like I have an i7 3930k and it's got six cores 
Well, if one of those six cores is waiting on one of the other cores to finish its calculation so it can take that variable and use it in the next calculation, you're going to have what's called an idle core. It's going to be sitting there waiting. So if you have one out of six cores that's idle, you're 16% idle. Let's say, though, you have 64 six-core processors. If one core goes idle, that's only one out of 384, or 0.2% idle. So these numbers might not sound like very much, because like if a CPU gets in idle state for just a moment, it literally is just in like milliseconds, right? Um, but how do we actually you know, measure performance of supercomputers? Uh, the performance of supercomputers is actually measured, um, like for example, this i7-3930K processor, it pushes out somewhere in the 120 to 150 G-flops or gigaflops. So what's that mean? So you might hear G-flops or gigaflops, but nowadays as far as supercomputers are concerned, you'll hear most likely petaflops, but also there's teraflops. So peta equals quadrillion, tera equals trillion, and giga equals billion. So an i7-3930K pushes 120 to 150 G-flops. So what the heck are G-flops? Well, the G or giga, it stands for what we just described here, gigas, billion, tera, and so on. Well, flops stands for floating point operations per second. Now, don't get too confused because sometimes you'll see all caps flops, and then you'll see F-L-O-P in caps and S underscore, or underscore, undercased or lowercased. They, are, they do mean different things. Um, so flops, all uppercase, means floating point operations per second, and then just F-L-O-P, uppercase, lowercase s, actually just means floating point operations, so it's not necessarily denoted by per second, because actually to calculate flops, you use flop, like how many flop, plural s, did you get? So anyway, uh, moving along. So 120 G-flops means we're getting 120 gigaflops or 120 billion floating point operations per second. Well, that sounds nice, but now it's time to consider architecture. See, CPUs traditionally have been built for more of brute, heavy lifting computing. As time goes by, we're seeing CPUs really getting ta being coming, taken over by their cousin, who has been pretty dormant for a while when it comes to high performance computing, the GPU. The name, Graphics Processing Unit, might not be the best name for it anymore since the GPU is now being used for far more things than just graphics now. The term GPGPU is floating around now, which stands for General Purpose Graphics Processing Unit. So what gives? Well, it turns out processing graphics over the years has prepared the GPU for processing or other processing tasks of this age, right? So any form of animation on a screen is actually the result of redrawing, right? In frames, that's where we get frame rate. So each movement you see is a clearing and then a redrawing onto your screen. It, each pixel is gonna be calculated. Sometimes it's not by pixel, sometimes it'll be like a model itself and there's multiple models, but in the end it's broken down by pixel. Uh, so it's gonna be calculated and each pixel's position, let's say, is often contingent on many other variables. So today's high performance games, like take Battlefield for example, they're gonna use really intense physics engines that calculate everything here. Imagine how much physics and calculations and variables come into play when calculating, let's say, an explosion, right? So that's kind of why if something explodes in Battlefield 3, if you've got or 4, if you've got kind of a poor graphics processing unit, that's you're gonna sh you're gonna start lagging because your frame rate goes down. So all these variables uh, depended on other things like physics, modeling. You know, gee, what's that sound like? Oh, right, the supercomputers, parallel computing. That's exactly what we're looking for here. So the i7-3930K processor, six cores, runs $570 new. Gives you a high peak of 150 G flops, giga flops. So let's poke around here. You'll find a GPU, let's see if we can find one for 570. Well, the Radeon HD 7970 is going to cost you about $550, so that's close enough. That will give you mm, about three-ish, four teraflops. Not gigaflops, teraflops. So we're talking quite the step up. And that's all basically in architecture. How is this thing set up and all of that? So notably, GPUs or GPGPUs are far more popularly used in supercomputers um, as well as just like heavy processing. So if you get on like a, a AWS 
and you need like a processing server, you're probably actually buying a GPU, not a CPU. Which honestly confused the heck out of me in the early days when I was looking for cloud computing and I kept finding all these graphics and I'm like, why do people want to use... <laughs> anyway, it was really confusing, but that's why. I mean, the GPU is just a superior um, large calculation kind of device here. So just for kicks, the number one supercomputer at least that is known, right, the number one publicly announced supercomputer is the Tianhe 2, which literally translates to Sky River, but really means Milky Way 2. Uh, this performs at a peak of 33.86 petaflops. This is 33.86 quadrillion floating point operations per second. So how do people build these things? Well, generally we have two types of supercomputers in existence. You've got your clusters and you've got your distributed systems. First, let's talk about clusters. This is what you think of when you literally think of a supercomputer. Clusters are nodes that are really close to each other, usually like in the same room. And these are going to be more efficient because there's no, well, there's less bandwidth and latency constraints slowing down data transfer and sharing. Um, and they're generally structured specifically for the job of supercomputing. Then you have things like distributed systems. This is where you have a network of computers spread around, hence distributed, connected via something like the internet, TCP, IP. Generally, distributed supercomputers are far more lax when it comes to efficiency. So you'll find many of these distributed computers, right, or supercomputers, uh, they're going to contain everything. You know, you've got computers, phones, tablets, desktop, netbooks, um, laptops, whatever. Uh, so folding at home is an example of this massive distributed supercomputer. Um, so one of the largest distributed supercomputers, um, but nowhere near the largest, is folding at home, and it pushes 18 petaflops or 18 quadrillion floating point operations per second. That's pretty impressive, and this one is dedicated purely to science and solving disease. So supercomputers can also be used for more malicious things. One of the largest targets for governments and supercomputers is doing things like cracking encryption. So it's somewhat likely that the NSA already has a supercomputer that's more powerful than 33.86 petaflops. And we do know that China is also working on a 100 petaflop computer. Um, and it's also likely that China themselves has another one that is secret, you know. Uh, so supercomputers today are a lot like nuclear weapons of the past, where a supercomputer capable of shattering, say, something like 256 AES encryption, to a large degree would render pretty much every business insecure, country's infrastructure insecure. Um, you could do a lot of damage if you had that much power. Luckily, it's unlikely that anyone does. Um, but interestingly enough, there is one supercomputer that is by far the largest supercomputer in the world, um, it's actually larger than every supercomputer in the world, put together, times 500, um, and still larger. And it's growing stronger and stronger every day. See, I was doing some research, and I'll probably dedicate a video to this on, on, on this on this topic specifically. But I will just mention it here. Last year, early 2013, the Bitcoin network surpassed one exaflop. Pretty much unheard of, as China, again, is trying to finish their 100 petaflop, and the NSA has probably got something around 200 to 300. Um, the Bitcoin network passed one exaflop, two, three, four, and today the Bitcoin network is measured at 287,158 petaflops, or 287 exaflops, and growing. And just for measure, it is February 2014. The Bitcoin network is the largest supercomputing network in history, outpacing all other known supercomputers on the planet added together by far. The network is very unique as there is no central server. So normally the data and all this stuff does come back to a central place, whereas the Bitcoin network's actual purpose <laughs> is to achieve network consensus. So it's almost like the network's purpose is to be what a central server would be, yet not be a central server. So the idea here is that there is no trusted third party or anyone in control of it. 
Um, so anyway, if you're more interested in Bitcoin, I won't bother anybody too much with Bitcoin uh, and how it works in this video. But it's actually a very impressive um, invention. But anyway, I will probably put out an, a video uh, more about the uh, size of the Bitcoin network and what people sh really should ought to be doing with the Bitcoin network, but they aren't. So stay tuned for that. And the, let's see, the last major part to the workings of a supercomputer is, you know, how do we get them to communicate with each other? So you can tie all your super or your computers together and put them on the same local area network. But how do you actually get them to start sharing processing jobs? Well, this is where the MPI comes in, which stands for Message Passing Interface. So what MPI does is it passes messages between the nodes to keep them working in a synchronized fashion on the same problem and it allows us to share resources to solve a problem. So that satisfies the basics of what a supercomputer is, what its purposes are, and all of that. And on the next video what we're going to be talking about is how you can build your very own supercomputer, what you're going to need, and all of that. So hopefully that sounds interesting to you guys. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for all the support and the subscriptions, and until next time.